Uh, thanks so much, Marie. And um, hi, everybody. Um, we are excited to be here and to introduce ourselves. Oh, sorry, it's me. To the um, to the Gosh community this morning. Um, we are IO Rodeo, and we've been making open um, science instruments for um, over thirteen years at this point. And today we'll um, just talk a little bit about um, our journey over the last thirteen years. Um, as well as talk a little bit about one of our electrochemistry products. And, um, and we'll also um, have a chance to hear from some of our customers about why they choose to use open science hardware in their work. So um, my, uh, my name is Jo, obviously, and we're a, a very small team. That's just me, myself and Will in IO Rodeo. And um, my role at IO Rodeo is on the application support and community development. That's kind of my what I mostly focus on. Um, my background just before starting IO Rodeo um, was I was a research scientist um, for about 10 years working on plant responses to the environment. I also um, spent a couple of years um, doing educational technology at a local school in LA. And, um, and I'm just gonna pass it over to Will now. Uh, hi, yeah, my name's Will. Um, and, and my role at IO Rodeo is primarily hardware and software development. And I, I currently split my time uh, 50 50 between IO Rodeo and Caltech. Um, or Is there an audio problem? Oh, so I, I, I currently split my time 50 50 between IO Rodeo and Caltech, where I also work as an instrumentation engineer. Um, um, and bef but before starting IO Rodeo, uh, uh, both Joe and I experienced some of the limitations of black box instruments firsthand when working in research labs. And we realized that there was um, a potential for um, open source uh, hardware and software and science and education. And so with this idea in mind, we founded IO Rodeo back in 2009. Um, so the, the, the mission, uh, of our initial mission was basically to try to increase uh, accessibility to scientific data collection tools by creating sort of low cost open source hardware instrumentation. And here you can see a sort of a screenshot of our, our website. Um, and, um, and this is found at iorodeo.com if you're interested in checking it out. And I wanted to talk a little bit about our journey uh, um, in running this company. Um, so we, we were founded in sort of late 2009 um, and um, we initially started as a consulting company just sort of developing custom instruments, um, open source hardware. And a big part of this was just sort of developing arenas for behavioral biology. So, and, and in doing this, we found that our customers were very receptive to the idea of sort of open source hardware, open source software. They're mostly sort of researchers and academics, and they, I think, sharing and knowledge transfer was important to them. And um, and, and though even though we're consulting, we always sort of planned uh, to transition to having sort of product line of our own. Um, we we envisioned sort of making low cost, accessible instruments that were had sort of had uh, open source software and open source hardware. And sort of gradually over the years, we've tried to transition to this, um, and we've had uh, various product lines over the years. Um, so one of our first products was uh, a display system for sort of making insect uh, flight arenas for behavioral and neurobiology. Um, and this was very closely related to the sort of consulting work that we were doing at the time. It's kind of, and sometimes it's even hard to distinguish the two. And this was not something we originally developed. These, these flight arenas have a long history in studying uh, insect flight. Um, and the, the generation of displays you see on the screen there were initially designed by my friend, Michael Reiser at Caltech. And we also um, contributed several unique designs to the system, new arenas and panels, um, et cetera. Um, and these systems are basically a visual display for making like a video game for fruit flies. It's kind of a very specialized piece of instrumentation. Um, and they're used for studying um, how uh, flies use visual inst inst information to control flight. And so basically the, the fruit fly is tethered to a pin. They show there's a sensor which measures what their wings are doing in real time. This is used to steer the display and then they can fly around in a virtual world. And so they're basically, the flies are playing the video game and the scientists will record things like record from the neurons in their brain while they do this. So we sold this system for about seven years, uh, but basically we stopped selling it when I rejoined Caltech, uh, splitting my time 50-50 between IO Rodeo and Caltech um, um, back in 2017. Um, and uh, this basically, had the, the issue was that the core that I was helping to start at Caltech um, was supporting lots of labs at Caltech and around the country, which are using the system and we wanted to avoid a conflict of interest. However, this system is still actively used around the world. It's open source hardware. Um, I now just support it from my position at Caltech rather than IRO Rodeo. But I think this shows a big difference between um, proprietary and open source hardware. Um, I, um, and I should point out that a lot of other people support the system besides just us. Um, and I could say a lot more about this, but in interest of time, I wanna move on to some of our other um, uh, uh, products. Um, another line of products that we have is our open colorimeter. 
uh, and it's accessories that go along with it. These sort of measure the absorbance of light through a sample, it has lots of applications for sort of water quality, measuring the concentrations of things like ammonia, nitrates, measuring turbidity, it can be used in education to, for, as a, for it's like an introduction to Beer's Law. You can see sort of an exploded view of our colorimeter down in the, in the, in the bottom right hand corner. Um, this began as a Kickstarter project, um, then, and this is back in 2012, I think in the early days of Kickstarter. I think Kickstarter was formed in 2009. Um, and we've been selling this for about 11 years now, with a small break in 2021 to redesign the system. The original system was based around the Arduino Uno, and the, the new system is, is, is designed around the Pi Badge, which is a really nice uh, development board by uh, Adafruit. Um, and we did this to incorporate some new technologies. The firmware is now in CircuitPython, and we made it standalone. We added battery power, we added a display. Um, a third line of products that we used to have, we don't sell anymore, was our gel, gel electrophoresis equipment. This sort of includes gel boxes, trans illuminators, a gel electrophoresis power supply, imaging enclosures. We sold these for about eight years, and, and I thought we had, we had some very cool products in this lineup. Uh, I will admit they did require a fair amount of manual work on our part. Um, and we did run into supply chain issues back in 2020, 2021, and we eventually decided it would be better to focus on our other product lines. Um, that said, the design files for these are all still available and people can still make them. And again, I think this shows an advantage to open source hardware. Um, sort of a, a, a fourth line of products that we have are our line of potentiostats and the accessories that go with them. And these have lots of applications from developing biosensors to sort of studying coatings and corrosion and electrochemical processes. And our interest in these really began uh, um, from a request from a high school teacher in LA who wanted to um, use the CheapStat Potentiostat, which is an open source Potentiostat developed by the Plaxico Group at UCSB. Uh, he wanted to use these in a summer project studying water quality in the LA River. And um, after this, we, we sort of became interested in Potentiostats and designed some of our own. Now uh, we designed the Rodeostat and the multi, multi-channel Rodeostat Plus, uh, the Rodeostat Featherwing, and we added things like programmable voltage and current ranges and, and uh, um, things like that. And, and so I think as a more detailed example of the types of open source products we sell, I wanted to look a little more closely at our Potentiostat products um, and sort of shown here um, on this slide, you'll see of two of our open source potential stats, the Rodeostat Featherwing and the Rodeostat. So the, the Featherwing itself is a sort of small, uh, low cost, like, like $20 potential stat, right? It's not standalone. You need an accompanying microcontroller to go with it. And it's really meant for adding a potential stat to an embedded project. Um, and then in, in the center, you can see our Rodeostat potential stat. This is um, sold as sort of a complete instrument. It comes pre-programmed with firmware, which includes various voltammetric tests. Corona amperometry, cyclic voltimetry. It comes with a Python library for controlling it from the host PC. There's web app software for controlling it without any programming. So you might ask, what is a potentiostat? So it's basically an electrochemical sensor with three electrodes working counter and reference. It uses feedback for control. So it actually controls the potential between the working and reference electrodes using the counter electrode as an actuator. Um, and, and while you're doing this, you can you simultaneously measure the working electrode current. And it's not passive. You, you often sweep the voltages to various waveforms, ramps, cycles, steps, pulses. And, and applications include sort of characterizing processes, measuring redox potentials, looking at the re studying the reversibility of reactions. You can also study coatings and corrosions. And it's often uh, used a lot for biosensor development. Um, and that's one of the big applications that the users have of our, our Rodeostat, we found. Um, so as an example of a biosensor, it might be something like a glucose test strip. Um, uh, you've probably all seen these. They're commercially available for monitoring blood sugar. Um, the, the, the test strip on the working electrode, yeah, there's an enzyme, it's an enzyme glucose oxidase plus an electron transfer mediator, and this allows it to work as a glucose sensor. So when the test strip is connected to the potentiostat and you give it a, a, a pulse and voltage using the active control system, um, and this results in sort of a time varying current at the working electrode, which is related to the glucose concentration. So if you sample the current at a particular time point after the step, you'll see that the, 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 the current is, is linearly correlated with the glucose concentration. This is so, sort of how these strips work as a sensor. Um, now we're not suggesting you replace your pocket glucose monitor with the rhodiostat. However, we think it provides a nice uh, demonstration of how a potentiostat can be used to test and develop biosensors. There's lots of different biosensors that can be made like this. So, so in, in addition to sort of making the um, open source hardware and the designs, um, we also uh, want them to be as flexible as possible for sort of end users and for this reason, we, we kind of accompany our devices with open source uh, software. So in try in trying to ensure our devices are as programmable and flexible as possible. So for example, with the firmware for the Rodeostat is, is programmable via the popular I, uh, Arduino IDE. Uh, we also you know, have a, a Python library, which uses the standard sort of scientific Python, Python stack, SciPy, NumPy, Matplotlib. We try to provide lots of coding examples to get people started. So if your experiments involve something like cyclic voltimetry, you can look up an example um, in, in our GitHub you know, examples directory and um, and, and use this to get started. Um, sort of in addition, we try to provide uh, lots of example projects and tutorials so people can learn by example and 
try to provide fun projects to get started learning how to use our instruments. And we've been selling sort of the Rodeo Stats for about six years now. And we've shipped uh, Rodeo Stats to over 320 cities around the world. So it's being used all, all over the world, which I think is really cool. Um, and in doing this, we've learned a lot from our customers, which Joe's gonna present a little bit about next. Yes, yeah, so um, thank you, Will. So in this section, um, we're going to talk a little bit about how and why our community is um, using open source hardware science instruments. Because um, I think as, as all of us here are instrument makers, um, we spend a lot of time designing and writing software and documentation. But in the end, you know, we want to see people using, modifying and sharing our designs. Um, so these images show some of our hardware being used in labs and classrooms. Um, so in order to try and understand, like we want to try and understand um, how and why people choose to use open hardware um, and what they are using it for and what are the benefits. And the reason we want to you know, understand this, um, I'm sure as you, as everybody here understands, it helps us to be able to better design, design the right tools and resources that people want, um, identify any barriers that might come up that you, you know, wouldn't have thought about. And, and also so just so that we can be better advocates for open hardware. Um, at the end of last year, we conducted a short 10 question survey of our customers. And one of the questions we asked was how they used open hardware in their projects and work. Um, you can see some of the responses on the slide, um, some sample responses. And um, we broke them down into like um, these rough categories uh, where you can see like 25% of our customers and people in our community are using it in education and 75% are using it for research and development. And we can further break down research and development into the categories that biosensor research and development, that's one of us a big category for us, um, biochemistry, molecular biology, environmental research, hardware development, biotechnology and biomedical research and electrochemistry research. And obviously this is a reflection uh, of the tools that we, that we sell as well. And so to, to get further insight, we, um, we decided to like get further information from like somebody who responded, who uses it for education and someone from research. And we asked, to, asked them to share with us how they are using open source science hardware in more detail. So this slide shows graduate student um, Joshua Kudoto, who's at the Leddy Research Group at the University of Iowa. And Josh and his colleague Andy are using the Rodeostat um, in, in teaching undergraduate electrochemistry classes. Um, and what's kind of exciting is that they recently were awarded a grant to exp expand the project to more labs um, this summer. So this image, you can see Josh setting up an electrochemical style using the uh, multi-channel rodeo stuff. So we asked Josh to share with us how he's using open hardware for education. And this is what Josh shared with us. We chose the rodeo stat for our classroom because it offers flexibility and robustness. Being open source hardware, instructors can better tailor experiments to match the learning outcomes of an experiment or course. In operating the instruments, students can execute provided scripts or build the operating code from the ground up. This makes the instrument suitable for both introductory and advanced courses, ranging from the basics of voltammetry to creating custom waveforms. From an educational perspective, a major benefit of RodeoStats over proprietary hardware is exposure to coding languages. Writing and interpreting code is a valuable skill for modern chemists and is often overlooked in curricula. By using open source hardware in the classroom, we are giving students experience that will aid them as future scientists. Um, and thank you to Josh for sharing that with us. In the next example, um, we will hear from someone in research and development. So Francesca Carlo is um, also um, using the rodeo stat and he's a principal scientist at the Diamond Light Synchrotron in the UK. Um, at the Synchrotron, they're building custom electrochemistry instrumentation. Just a little bit of background, the Diamond Light Source is the UK's National Synchrotron Science Facility. And um, Francesco works at the IO7, which is the high resolution X-ray diffraction beam line for investigating structure of surfaces and interfaces under different conditions. 
And at the beam line, they need to be able to support complicated, you know, complex experiments. Um, because, um, and because of that, it's necessary to be able to easily control the hardware. Um, so shown here on this slide is, is an example of the kind of experiments Francesco and his team are doing at the IO7. But for the purposes of um, this talk, we don't need to understand all of the detail, um, details of these experiments. But what is important to understand on this slide is that um, you can see that they need, they need to be able to change the solutions in the electrochemical cell at the same time as controlling the applied potential. So if you look at box two, um, you can see on the x axis is time. And um, with time, they're cycling through different solutions in the electrochemical cell. While at the same time on the y axis, you can see that they're changing the, the potential of the electrochemical cell. So on the next side, you can see what this actually looks like in the lab. Um, so this picture shows the rhodiostat integrated into the EC ALD system. And the rhodiostat is on the left-hand side. Um, the electrochemical cell is in the center, it has the tubing coming out on either side, and that um, has the working counter and reference electrodes. And the, um, the tubing is connected to the solution distribution system. So like Josh, we asked Francesco to share with us um, the importance of using open hardware um, in his work. So we decided to use a rhodiostat for this application because com commercial systems don't have enough flexibility. We wanted to be able to directly control the instrument using scripts, which is something commercial instruments and software do not allow to do. For us, it was also important to control from the same Linux machine multiple hardware components and have the possibility of creating scripts to coordinate the actions of the different components, e.g. apply a potential, change the solution in the cell, and in the future, controlling illumination in photoelectrochemical experiments. And um, we're grateful to Francesco for sharing that with us. Um, finally, another way we can learn about how our customers are using open source hardware is to look in the literature. So we search papers, um, we search in the literature for papers that use the Rhodiostat, and we look for mentions of like why they chose to use open source hardware. Um, so the, on, the first, on this first slide, we show some selected quotes from papers where they mention accessibility as being important to them. So they said that open hardware dramatically increases accessibility, lowers the cost and provides access to tools in low resource and resource limited labs. Um, in the Kandahari paper, which is like the third quote down, um, they were talking about how in traditional labs, they have like one potentiostat, which everybody has to, you know, these are expensive pieces of equipment. There are thousands of dollars um, typically. And so they have one instrument and all of the students are like typically having to watch a, de a demonstration. And so they don't get any hands-on experience. But with open source hardware, you can like have each student pair could have their own, um, can have their own instrument, and then they can run their own experiments and get that hands-on, a hands-on experience that, that we need. Beyond accessibility, we can also see um, in the literature that there are other benefits, such as um, access to open source software with sample code, online support for our community support, um, simplified integration with other hardware and the ability to make custom modifications. And I'll just mention that all of these papers are on our website. We actually wrote um, a newsletter article about it back in August. So if you want to learn more um, about this in more detail, um, you can check out our newsletter archive. So in summary, um, we learned a few things about why our customers are using instruments by doing surveys, by talking to customers and reviewing the literature. And they report that open hardware um, is more easily incorporated in larger custom instruments because it's programmable and flexible. Um, you can, it allows for custom modifications to create new instruments and provides way to naturally include programming in science education. Um, and we can dramatically increase accessibility to instrumentation because it's low cost, affordable, and it can, you know, allows for more hands-on learning. 
Okay, so um, I would also like to take this opportunity to invite everyone here to subscribe to our newsletter, um, which is at blog.iorodeo.com. We haven't really had a chance to talk about our um, design process and the tools that we use in this um, today, but um, we do document all of that in our newsletter. And um, we also use it to share resources, um, like links to our, any tutorials or user guides as, they, as we put them out. And we also like to share community projects and resources. We um, did a spotlight on GOSH um, a few months ago, and we would definitely love to invite anyone here that would like to have their project highlighted or um, in a newsletter, please do uh, reach out. And um, let's see. We, our um, emails are at the end of this slide, so you can reach out to us via email. Um, also do check out our website, uh, iorodeo.com. All of our documentation is at blog.iorodeo.com and you can follow us on um, socials at iorodeo on Twitter and Instagram. And thank you so much everyone for listening to our talk. We'll uh, look forward to your questions.